This is the Atexel GCSE 9 to 1 Maths Foundation Paper 2 from the June 2017 series. Question number 1 for part A, we have to simplify 5p subtract 3p plus p. Altogether, we will end up with 3p. For part B, we have to simplify m cubed plus another m cubed. Altogether, we would have 2 m cubed. For part C, we have 10 plus 3c plus 5d minus 7c plus d. Well, if we collect like terms, numbers only, we've got 10. For the c's, we've got 3c minus 7c, that's minus 4c. 5d plus another d, that is 6d. Question number two, we have to write 56.78 correct to one significant figure. Well, if I draw a number line, and if I write this number to one significant figure, the number will be in between 50 and 60. Our halfway point is 55. Our number, 56.78, is over here. And therefore, because 56.78 is 55 and greater, we would round up to the 60. Question number three. A teacher asks the students in year six what type of transport they use to get to school. The dual bar chart shows some of the results. For part A, what is the most popular type of transport used by the boys? So for boys, the most popular one is walk. So we have walk. Next, seven girls walk to school. We have to show this information on the dual bar chart. So what we need to do is show information for seven. Well, here is that information shown. Now for part C, more of the students get to school by car than bus. How many more? So what we need to do over here is find out how many take car. So what we have for car is five for boys and we've got nine for girls. So all together for car, we've got five plus 9, which is 14, and for bus, if we work out the information for bus, we've got 6 for boys and 5 for girls, rather we've got 4 for girls. So all together we've got 6 plus 4, which is 10. So therefore, the difference between these is 4. So there are 4 more students who take car than bus. Then the number of students in year 5 is the same as the number of students in year 6. What's the total number of students in year 5 and 6? So here is information for year 6. So what we need to do is find out the total. So here I've got 9 boys who walk, 7 girls who walk, then we have four boys who cycle and then we've got 
one girl who cycles. Then we've got two boys who take other and one girl who takes other. So what we need to do is add those up. So in year six, we add these together, we get 48. And in year five then, we would have the same amount, 48. And therefore, the total is 48 in year five, 48 in year six, we get 96 in total. Question number four here are four fractions. We have to write these fractions in order of size, start with the smallest fraction. Well, the problem is so far the denominators are all different. We want the denominators to be the same. So, what is the lowest common multiple of 5, 32 and 15? Well, that would be 30. So we can rewrite every single fraction out of 30. As we see here. So 2 fifths, that's the same as 12 out of 30. 11 out of 30, well, can't do much with that. 1 half, that's the same as 15 out of 30. And 7 fifteenths, that's the same as 14 out of 30. And now what we can do is order these. So smallest one is this, followed by this, followed by this, followed by this. So if we apply that idea to this, then what we can see is the 11 thirtieths is the smallest. So we have 11 over 30, followed by the 2 fifths, followed by the 7 over 15, followed by the one half. As we see here. Question number five. David sells CDs in the shop. The tally chart shows information about the number of CDs David sold on Monday, Tuesday and on Wednesday. The part here we have to write down one thing that's wrong with the tally chart. Well, for Monday we've got 12, that's fine. With Tuesday, we've got 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's fine. For Wednesday, we've got 5 plus the 3, which is 8. Now, Monday is incorrect. That's not 12. It's actually 13. So Monday should have a frequency of 13, not 12. Then Drew drew this pictogram to show the information for Tuesday and Wednesday. We have to write down one thing that's wrong with this pictogram. Well, here for Tuesday, we've got 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. So that's information for Tuesday. And Wednesday, we've got 3, 6, and then half of 1 will be 1 1.5. So that's 7.5 in total. We've got 8. So. Wednesday's pictogram shows 7.5, not 8. Question number 6. There are 495 coins in a bottle. One third of the coins are £1 coins. 124 of the coins are 50p coins. The rest of the coins are 20p coins. We have to work out the total value of the 495 coins. Well, if I think about the £1 coins then how many of those will I have well I've got one third multiplied by 
495 and if we work this out we get 165 so we've got 165 one pound coins and therefore the total value of all of our one pound coins we would have one multiplied by 165 well let's be specific we've got one pound multiplied by 165 which is 165 pounds if we now consider the 50p coins we've got 124 are 50p coins and therefore the value of this we've got 50p not 0 0.50 pounds multiplied by 124 we've got 124 50p coins so we end up with 62 pounds and if we think about the 20p coins well we've got 495 coins in total 165 of them are one pound coins 124 of them are 50p coins so this means we have 206 20p coins and therefore the total value of all our 20p coins we've got 0 0.20 multiplied by 206 and it turns out we get 41 pounds 20 pence so therefore the total value we've got 165 one pound worth of coins for one pound coins we've got 62 pounds from the 50 p's 41 pounds 20 from the 20 p's and it turns out we get 268 pounds and 20 pence So we have two hundred and sixty eight pounds twenty pence. Question number seven The probability that a new fridge has a fault is not point not one five. What's the probability that the fridge does not have a fault? So the probability that the fridge does not have a fault we've got one subtract not point not one five which is not point nine eight five Question number eight. Here is a list of numbers, and for part here, from the list, from the numbers in the list, we have to write down the square number. So, an example of a square number will be the twenty-five. So we have twenty-five. For part B, we have to, from the numbers in the list, write down a number that is a multiple of both four and six. A number that's in the both the four times table and the six times table that would be twenty four. Then for part C we have to write down all the numbers in the list that are prime. So prime means it's got factors of one and itself only. So we would have the twenty three and the 29 as prime numbers question number nine what we have to do is find the value of x now we know angles around a point sum to 360 so we've got 3x plus 2x plus 90 degrees this is equal to 360. 
5x plus 90 is 360. Subtract a 90 from both sides. 5x is 270. And if we divide both sides by 5, x is equal to 54. we've got 54. Question number 10. Suha is going to buy 150 envelopes. Here is some information about the cost of envelopes in two shops. So with letters to send we get a pack of 25 envelopes for 349 and with stationary world we buy a pack of 10 envelopes for £2.10 and if we buy two packs we get another one free. Now, Suha wants to buy the envelopes as cheaply as possible. Which shop should Suha buy her 150 envelopes from? You must show how you get your answer. Well, if we take a look at letters to send, if we get 25 envelopes for 349, that would mean what we need is 150 divided by 25, which is six packs. And the cost of this, well, I would have to do six multiplied by 349, which is 20 pounds, 94. And if we look at stationary world, well, if one pack of 10 envelopes costs £2.10 and if we buy two packs we get one free, that means that a pack of 30 is, well, that will be £4.10. And the reason we get £4.10 is if I get two packs that means I would have 20 and the extra free with it that's another 10 so there's 30 in total and because I'm paying for two I would have to do two ten times two so if I do 150 divided by 30, I would get 5 packs needed. And then doing 5 times by 410, we would get 21 pounds. So which is cheaper? Well, letters to send is cheaper, so we should get the pack from here. Question number 11. You can use this graph to change between inches and centimetres. The part here you have to change 74 centimetres to inches. So 74, if we find out where this is, well, here we've got 60, here we've got 70, then we've got 72, 74. So that is here, and then I draw a line across, like so, and then we would go down to here and it turns out 74 centimeters is 29 inches so we have 29 next for part b daniel's height is six feet three inches and we know that in one foot there's 12 inches what is Daniel's height in centimetres? What we need to do is convert 6 foot 3 inches into inches. Well, that will be 6 times by 12 plus an extra 3, which is 75. So we have 75 inches. And now if we go back to our graph and find out where 75 is, 75 inches well 
We can't find that out straight away. But what we can do is find out information for 25 inches. So, if we convert for 25 inches, with this we can find out information for 75 inches. And we can do that by multiplying by 3. So, 25 inches, we draw a vertical line up from here. And then we draw a line across. So we've got 60 to 63. So we have 25 inches, which is equal to 63 centimeters. Now, if I multiply that by 4, we get 252. So we would have 252 centimeters. Question number 12, we have to find the value of the square root of 13.4 subtract 1.5 over 6.8 plus 0 0.06 all squared. And we have to write down all the figures that our calculator displays. So type in the fraction button in the square root, We've got 13.4 subtract 1.5 divided by then open and close the brackets. Here we've got 6.8 plus 0 0.06 and squared. And our calculator would display 0 0.073303. Five nine zero eight one. Question number thirteen. For part A, we have to rotate shape A ninety degrees clockwise about center O. Well, if we do that, we will end up with this shape here. Now, for part B, we have to describe fully the transformation that maps B onto C. Well. What we have is this mirror line over here, and therefore we end up with a reflection in the y axis. Question number 14 for part A we have to factorize 5 minus 10m. Well, in terms of the numbers, 5 is common to both, and inside the bracket we would have 1 minus 2m. Then for part b, we have to factorise fully 2a squared b plus 6ab squared. Well, in terms of the numbers, what's common to both the 2 and the 6 is 2. What's common to a squared and a is a. What's common to b and b squared is b. So 2ab is our highest common factor, and what goes inside the bracket is a plus 3b. Question number 15. For part A, we have to write 4.7 times 10 to the minus 1 as an ordinary number. Well, we've got this 4.7 times 10 to the minus 1. And I'm going to move the decimal place 1 to the left. And the 0 would go here. So we end up with 0 0.47. Then for part B, we have to work out the value of 2.4 times 10 to the 3 times 9.5 times 10 to the 5 in standard form. Well, you will recall for standard form, that's when a number is written as a times by 10 to the power of n, where a is in between 1 and 10, but does not include 10. So, if I type this into my calculator, I've got 2.4 times 10 to the 3 multiplied by 9.5 times 10 to the 5 and it turns out here we get 2 2 8 0 and then we've got 6 zeros and what we need to do if we imagine our decimal point here we need to move this decimal place 1 2 3 4 5 
six, seven, eight, nine to the left, leaving us with two point two eight times ten to the nine. Question number 16. A, B and C are three points on a map. That's what we see here. And we are told that one centimetre represents 100 metres. And the point T is 250 metres from point A. And point T is equidistant from point B and point C. On the map, we have to show one of the possible positions for T. So... First of all, we've got one centimetre which represents 100 metres and what that will mean then is point T, if that's 250 metres from point A, dividing 250 by 100, we get 2.5 centimetres. So we have 2.5 centimetres from the point A. So, if we grab a ruler and then measure out 2.5 centimeters, which is here, then from point A, what we would do is draw a circle with radius 2.5 centimeters. That's what we see here. And now if point T is equidistant from point B and point C, then what we would do is need draw the perpendicular bisector of B, C. So, we need to draw the perpendicular bisector of B, C. So, if we grab our pointy bit of the compass and then we want the radius to be more than half of this line, for example, that's more than half, and then we draw a series of arcs. So there's one arc and Here would be the other arc. So the perpendicular bisector. This point needs to be joined up with this point with a straight line. So if we do that, then we've got this situation here. And so what we need to do is show possible positions for T. So what we know already is it's, 100, it's 250 meters from point A. So it has to lie on this circle somewhere. And is equidistant from B and C. Well, everywhere on this line is equidistant from B and C. So two possible positions. We could have our point here for T or we could have our point here for T. So we could have T here or we could have T here. Show either of them. Question number 17. The table shows the probabilities that a bias ties will land on a 2, on 3, on 4, on 5, and on 6. And Neymar rolls the bias dice 200 times. We have to work out an estimate for the 
total number of times the dice will land on one or on three. Well, let's call this unknown probability of landing on a one x. And we know that probability adds up to one. So we have x plus 0 0.17 plus to 0 0.18 plus 0 0.09 plus to 0 0.15 plus to 0 0.1 is equal to 1. So I've got x plus 0 0.69 equals 1. X therefore is equal to 0 0.31. So the probability, well, let's add this in. We've got 0 0.31. The probability of landing on a 1 or 3, we've got 0 0.31 plus 0.18 and if we work out this probability we get 0.49 so if we roll the bias dice 200 times we would have 200 multiplied by 0.49 which is equal to 98. So we're expecting it to land on a 103 98 times. Question number 18. On Saturday, some adults and some children were at a theatre. The ratio of the number of adults to the number of children was 5 to 2. Each person had a seat in the circle or had a seat in the stalls. Three quarters of the children had seats in the stalls. 117 Children had seats in the circle. There are exactly 2,600 seats in the theatre. On the Saturday, were there people on more than 60% of the seats? You must show how you get your answer. First of all, we can see that one quarter of the children had seats in circles. So, what we can do is find out the total number of children. What we know already is this one quarter of children would represent... 117 children because 117 of those are sat in a circle and we know that one quarter of children had seats in circles so the total number of children we would have 4 times by 117 which is equal to 468 now we know that the ratio of adults to children is 5 to 2 so the ratio of adults to children is 5 to 2 and we've got 468 children in total. Now to go from here to here what we do is we multiply by 234. So if I multiply 5 by 200 and 34 we would get 1170 so there's 1170 adults and therefore the total number of people we've got 1170 plus 468 and if we work this out we get six 1638. So the percentage of seats taken then, we've got 1638 divided by 2600, and if I multiply that by 100 to convert it into a percentage, We get 63 percent. This is clearly greater than the 60 percent and therefore we can conclude yes. 
Question number 19. The diagram shows a prism with a cross section in the shape of a trapezium. And on the centimeter grid below, we have to draw the front elevation and the side elevation of the prism. Use a scale of two centimeters to one meters. So, if we think about the side elevation, well, here is the side. Now, if we've got two centimeters representing one meter, that means here I would have to show two centimeters. And if 0 0.5 meters, well, that's going to be one centimeter going up with our scale. So here we have the side elevation. And now we have to draw the trapezium. Now here it's two meters high. So that will be four centimeters. So for the front elevation, well, here we've got the front elevation and four centimeters is here. Then we've got two meters. So that is four centimeters here. Then we've got 0 0.5 meters. So that's one centimeter up. And then we've got the slanted bit here. So this is the front. Question number 20. Ollie drove 56 kilometers from Liverpool to Manchester. He then drove 61 kilometers from Manchester to Sheffield. Ollie took an average speed of from Liverpool to Manchester of 70 kilometers per hour. Ollie took 75 minutes to drive from Manchester to Sheffield. And what we have to do is work out Ollie's average speed for his total drive from Liverpool to Sheffield. Well, here we've got a diagram. Liverpool to Manchester and then Manchester to Sheffield. Now we know Liverpool to Manchester is 56 kilometers. That's how far he drives. And then Manchester to Sheffield, we've got 61 kilometers. And we know from Liverpool to Manchester, the speed is 70 kilometers per hour. And we know from Manchester to Sheffield, the time is 75 minutes. And if we convert this into hours by dividing by 60, we get 1.25 hours. So what we can do is find the, well, what we need to do is find the average speed. So what we need to do is find out the total time it takes to go from Liverpool to Sheffield. So the time from Manchester to Sheffield, that's 1.25 hours. And what we can do is find out the time it takes to go from Liverpool to Manchester. We can do this by working out 56 divided by 70, which is 0 0.8. So here we've got 0 0.8 hours. So if we've got 0 0.8 hours from Liverpool to Manchester and then 1.25 hours from Manchester to Sheffield, that means the total time we've got 0 0.8 plus the 1.25 and it turns out here we get 2.05 hours and then we can find out the total distance the total distance We've got 56 plus 61, which is 117 kilometers. So for the average speed, we would have the distance 117 kilometers 
divided by the total time, 2.05 hours. And if we work out what this is to three significant figures, we would have 57.1. Kilometers per hour, and this is to three significant figures. Then, Journey drove from Barnsley to York. Journey's average speed from Barnsley to Leeds was 80 kilometers per hour, Her average speed from Leeds to York was 60 kilometers per hour, and Journey says that. The average speed from Barnsley to York can be found by working out the mean of 60 km per hour and 8 and 60 km per hour. If journey is correct, what does this tell you about the two parts of journey's journey? Well, the time taken for the two parts of the journey must be the same. Question number 21. We've got A, B, C and E. ECD, which are straight lines, and EA is parallel to DB, and that's what we see in this diagram. We've got EC equaling 8.1 centimeters, DC equaling 5.4 centimeters, and DB equaling 2.6 centimeters, and we have to work out the length of AE. Now, what we'll do is we'll create two separate triangles. So we've got our two triangles, and what we know is EC is 8.1 centimeters, DC is 5.4 centimeters, and DB is 2.6 centimeters. And we need to work out the length of AE, this length here. And what we can do is find out the length scale factor. You will find this corresponds with this. So to work out the scale factor, 5.4 divided by 8.1, rather, 8.1 divided by 5.4 is 1.5. So, from the small ship to the big ship, we times by 1.5, the big ship to the small, small ship to the the big shape to the small shape, we would divide by 1.5. So, to work out AE, we would do 2.6 times 1.5, which is 3.9. So we've got 3.9. Then we are told that AC is 6.15 centimeters. And with this, we have to work out the length AB. Well, before we work out the length AB, we know what this entire length is. If we work out what BC is, we can find out what this length here is. So, we can find out the length of BC. BC will equal 6.15 divided by 1.5, which is 4.1. So we've got 4.1 here. So if this length is 4.1, the total length adds up to 6.15. So therefore, AB equals 6.15, subtract 4.1, which is 2.05. Question 22. Anil wants to invest 25,000 for three years in a bank. With personal bank, compound interest is 2% for each year. And with secure bank, the compound interest is 4.3% for the first year and 0.9% for each extra year. Which bank will give Anil the most interest at the end of the three years? He must surely working. Well, if we take a look at the personal, then the interest here we've got 
2% for each year compound interest. So our interest is 1.02 cubed. And it turns out we get 1.06 one two zero eight and with the secure the interest is equal to one point zero or three that's for the first year and then after that we've got one point zero zero nine squared so that's for the other two years so if I work this out one point zero four three times one Point zero zero nine squared. It turns out we get one point zero six one eight five eight four eight three. So which bank gives more interest? Well, this amount here is greater than this amount. So the secure bank gives the most interest. Question number 23. A number n is rounded to two decimal places. The result is 4.76. Using inequalities, we have to write down an error interval for n. Well, our lower bound, that will be 4.755, which is less than or equal to n. And then for our upper bound, we've got 4.765. So here is our error interval. Question number 24, we have to solve x squared plus 5x minus 24 equals 0. Well, we need to factorise this. We are looking for two numbers which multiply to give the 5, which add to give the minus 24. Those two numbers are 8 and minus 3. So when we come to factorise, we have x plus 8 multiplied by x minus 3. And this is equal to 0. So either the x plus 8 is equal to 0 or the x minus 3 is equal to 0. So from this either x is minus 8 or x is equal to 3. So I've got solutions x equals minus 8 x equals 3. Question number 25. Here are the first six terms of an arithmetic sequence. We have to find an expression in terms of n for the nth term of this sequence. Well, to go from one term to the next, what we do is we add on 5. And so the inverse operation of adding 5 is to subtract 5. So our zeroth term is 3 subtract 5, which is minus 2. So our nth term, we would have 5n minus 2. Then the nth term of a different sequence is 3n squared. Nathan says that the fourth term of the sequence is 144. Is Nathan right? Show how you get your answer. Well, the fourth term is given by n equaling 4. So we have 3 multiplied by 4 squared. 3 times by 16 is 48. This does not equal the 144 which Nathan got. So Nathan is incorrect. Question 